Humble Sound Records, do distributors put a cap on a certain amount of streams for it to be flagged? No, and here's the thing. Music distributors, when we really get into the ring with them and we're like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and, and now we're throwing out words like lawsuits and conversion, right? Which is like the lawyer way of saying theft, stealing our clients' money, all this kind of thing. And we're like, prove it. You know, you're saying all this stuff. You have to actually prove it. And distributors kind of clam up and they're like, well, we don't want to share our methods, our proprietary methods of how we figure out whether someone is paying for fake plays. And I understand that to a degree, if they are going to reveal something and somehow we're going to go and like tell our clients so that they can defraud music platforms. But someone made a really good point about this. And he's like, what's interesting here is that on music platforms, there are advertisers who are paying, right? So not all of us, you know, pay for subscriptions. And so if you are on the free version, there are advertisers who are paying to get in front of you to have their products and services advertised, which is how the DSPs are getting paid, right? So there's money's going in. And then from some of those monies, they get paid to the distributors because they're going to you for the plays of your music. And even if they're like fake plays, right? And so if someone had paid for fake streams and then those monies go to the distributor and then the distributor's like, aha, we caught you, you big faker. And we're gonna keep those monies now. And someone goes, well, wouldn't you just need to return that money to the DSPs? Because the DSPs were the ones that got defrauded, allegedly, but really it was the advertisers too. So really it should just go through all the chains of title all the way back to the advertisers. I was like, that's a really good point. Cause you know, obviously my whole thing here and the one-to-one -one that I had made was music distributors don't just get to keep your royalties if they think there's been some kind of violation, which, you know, the biggest issue here being if they're not going to prove it, what am I going to do with that? If you can definitively say, here's the evidence, there's no question, da, 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 da. But even in that scenario, why are you pocketing the money? Why aren't you returning it? To the rightful owner. I'm a new artist preparing to release my second single and I'm second guessing using DistroKid again because they're another one of the big ones. All right, that's fair. Look, all I can share is there've been problems. Everyone's had a problem, I think, with pretty much every distributor. I have personally used DistroKid before. I didn't run into a problem, but my issue, especially with TuneCore, and I even said this at the end of my first video, and I'm like, I'm not saying that they provide crappy services, right? There's a lot of artists who might use DistroKid and TuneCore, and they're overall, they haven't had an issue. The issue is when an issue comes up and how the company treats you and handles you. And also, now that we're looking behind the curtains at their terms of service on how they're actually doing this, and then when we say, hey, we think that this is unlawful. Hey, this is against applicable laws in the jurisdiction that your terms of service are in. And they just blatantly ignore that. That's when we start saying, hmm, this is a problem. All right, question, what distributor have you used most in your career? I actually started with CD Baby and then I just got a little frustrated because at the time they didn't win all the, you know, the TikTok and, and you know, we started using so much more reels and stories and stuff like that. They didn't have their deal in place specifically with TikTok. And so I jumped ship with them and I ended up going to Symphonic and I actually ended up just jumping ship from them too because I had an issue come up. The way they handled it, the way they treated me, I was like, oh my goodness. All right, we're good. So I ended up moving on to DistroKid. Totally had a fine relationship with DistroKid. You know, no real complaints there. But I ended up going with Preamp Digital just because they gave me a way better deal, way better communication. I, I just had a better overall experience. A music Attorney is your number one legal resource for artists, producers, and record labels. Get contract templates, one-on-one -on -one legal advice, free master classes, and everything you need for your music business. Go to topmusicattorney.com. Can you give some social marketing tips regarding promoting? Yes, I can. And in fact, um, we have a Facebook group on Top Music Attorney Facebook page. I was kind of telling you guys that I'm going to do a masterclass for social media marketing. But one little quick one that I'll share is that I have a technique that I do that no one else that I know <laughs> does this thing which is audience harvesting. I just love sharing all these things that I try for my own releases. So audience harvesting on any platform, any size of audience that you have, you can get people to go and do one small thing, ask them one small thing. And you get on a live stream and you go, hey, I need you to go and do this thing right now. So for example, I have, you know, Top Music Attorney podcast email list, right? So I go, I want you to go and get on the email list because I'm going to be sending updates about this great social media uh, masterclass, which I'm actually going to do. So for example, if you want to go and sign up, 
up and get on the newsletter. So you get that email, blah, 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 blah. So I give you one action. I go, go right now. And then if we were in maybe a little more casual of a setting, I'd make it fun. I'd go do that, come back. And then when you come back, I'll shout you out. And I give you like a, a, a reward. Anyway, so we have these techniques that are very unique and they have worked so well. And so I'm going to talk about stuff like that when we do the, the masterclass. So anyway, there we go. I just did it for you in, in real time. So, so sign up on the newsletter, tommyusicattorney.com forward slash newsletter, or just go to the website. <laughs> My friend made a cover uploaded to YouTube. Someone else took her vocal performance and made it AI with this, the same instrumental and reloaded on YouTube, giving her zero credit. Okay. So, I mean, lots of issues there and it's not just like the copyright question, but it's also publicity issues. And so, for example, if this was me and someone's like, ah, I just use your thing. And I was upset about it. And it was like my voice and I didn't give them permission. The biggest claim that I have is use of my likeness, right? Name, image, likeness. And so you can get stuff pulled down just for that. And you go, you are infringing. I'm like Britney Spears. You're like, I made a Britney Spears song and it's not, it's like AI generated. Then, you know, Obviously, Britney Spears and her team can pull it down just for that reason alone. But if you're using aspects of the original song as well, that would be what's called a derivative work. It's like a remix. Okay, that's how we kind of parallel this. You are using something that has parts of someone else's thing in it. Copyright infringement. So you can file, it's called a DMCA takedown, but like on YouTube, it's basically just report, you know, you go to file a report. So it's a copyright claim. Michael, question. I oversee catalogs from two artists. I am looking for the best way to distribute multiple acts. Does it make sense to start an umbrella label company and place the acts within? Okay, so if you're starting basically your own, and this is what I say to all, everyone on, uh, who follows, I'm such an advocate for you learning how to think like a record label and to sell like a rock star, okay? So even if you are just doing your own thing, you have no intention to sign more artists and be like a traditional label, you should still be your own music business. So I go, if you think like a label, you become a really great marketer. You become really great at monetizing your content. And you're not just like, ah, oh, you know, I need to just get more streams. And that's like the extent of what you do. I'm like, no, really think of this like you were a label. Anyway, so back to your point of, yes, you should absolutely start an umbrella label company. So just meaning start your own label and have your artist signed with your label. You just need a recording agreement. I have templates and things like that that you can get from topmusicattorney.com. And so you want to just make sure you always have agreements for everything that you're doing, but particularly for, you know, when you're signing artists to your label. What are some good promo ideas for artists? I'm going to do this masterclass because the way I see it and what I really focus on with, especially when we do like deep dive music business, you know, classes and stuff like that. There's music synchronization, getting your music into TV, film and games. As far as revenue, okay, I'm going to really focus on this is how we get you paid. These are the things that we need to do to make sure you are making money and you're not just sitting back hoping that there's going to be a bunch of streams because streams aren't going to pay you anything. And there are ways that like record labels that we can really monetize what you are doing, your music and have you doing ancillary things. And then we have the marketing aspects. The most important thing is making sure you are constantly showing up and getting people just to love you. There's billions of people in this world. Any grouping of them, any size is your audience. There's people who really dig you, who dig your music, and it's just a matter of you finding them, but you have to show up. And so a lot of this is getting out of your own way. And so having things like an easy to follow music marketing schedule. So you just follow through and then getting ideas of what kind of content you make, trying to make it fun, very effortless. So then we're constantly showing up. We're building the social media, which then guess what? Then we're going to have the audience to sell to because we'll have all these great techniques and things that we're doing. And then over here is just kind of the legal stuff, which all kind of group together, right? So in the legal realm, you have, you need contracts. You just do got to have contracts for all the things that you do, because the biggest thing that you guys miss that under copyright law here in the United States, if you don't have signed contracts saying, Hey, you know, I worked with this person and I'm going to own the song. Even if you said it, even if you wrote it in an email, if you didn't sign a contract, then that ownership from the copyright didn't transfer as the lawyer. What ends up happening is that later on, I'm the one that has to go to court and, and you might lose. And I'm like, ah, you know, the Johnny paid $10,000 for this song and they agreed and all this stuff, but you didn't get the contract. So for purposes of things like ownership, making sure people get paid properly, making sure people get credited properly, all that stuff, you got to have the contracts, but then like copyrights, making sure you're registering your copyrights, making sure you're getting your trademark. So it's like this whole realm of all the legal stuff, but then 
all this synergistically has to work together, monetization efforts, marketing efforts, and then staying legally protected. And once you have all that kind of working together, all of a sudden you're like a label. You know what you're doing. You're being more meaningful with your time. You're starting to make money and you're actually growing. And that's when stuff starting starts to feel really good. And you feel like so excited about the little wins because you see how this really does work. It's not like, ah, oh, here's the perfect formula to, you know, totally change your career, but sort of like, these are the things that get missed. And so someone's like, oh my gosh, I was like, I posted like five times in a row and I released two songs last month. I don't know why I'm not a big star. And they don't understand that you have to be doing kind of like all these things on a, on a baseline level. If you're a hustler like me working on your career every day, go to topmusicattorney.com to apply to work directly with me. Let's get your music business to six figures and beyond. What state is best for an LLC if I'm based in California, especially if music income isn't very high to cover the high LLC annual fee? Should I have two LLCs, one for the label artist and one publishing company? So, you know, for our clients, I always say just start with one. It's fine. You can have one umbrella company that oversees all the things, at which point you actually start doing stuff with your LLC and it makes sense. Like we have some of our clients who are like indie artists and their stuff starts blowing up and they're touring. We'll do different LLCs. One's for the touring stuff, one's for the merchandise stuff. You see what I'm saying? And so it makes sense because if your LLC over here gets sued and you lose, you know, and you have to pay a judgment, it doesn't impact these companies. So that's why we do it. It's, cre it's, it's creative lawyering to just, you know, diversify the potential liability. But to your point, in California, there's what is it, $850 that you have to pay annually to just exist. So it doesn't make much sense if you're not making a ton of money and you're like, ah, you know, I got to pay essentially a grand every year to just exist. So what some clients do is they look at different states. So for example, in Arizona, you can have an LLC besides just setting it up, which is like 50 bucks. There's no annual fee just to exist. It's, you know, better. But the downside is that you have to have what's called a statutory agent. You have to have someone who is in the state that you have your company set up in to accept legal docs. And often it's you, right? So as a business owner, but if you don't happen to be there, then you get a service, you know, like a virtual address and there's a fee with that. So it's all very like cost benefit analysis. What is cheaper? If you step in Arizona and you find a company that's going to charge you three or $400 a year to be your virtual address, that's cool. I mean, you're saving some money.